Uh, well, good morning. Uh, welcome to today's um, <clears throat> lecture, part of the series of Knowledge Miles lectures uh, to celebrate the 695th Lord Mayor um, during his mayoral term. Um, I'm delighted to be here to moderate today's event on urban transport in tomorrow's world, uh, what other growing cities can learn from London, uh, with Chris Williamson, Global Chair of Western Williamson and Partners. Uh, my job really is to uh, do some very quick introductions um, and then to leave space uh, so we can hear from Chris. Um, and the programme for today is very simple. Um, we simply, uh, after my introduction, we'll hear um, Chris's lecture and there'll be time for Q&A towards the end of the session. If you haven't used the um, GoToWebinar system before, the way to put a question in is to find the question tab on the dashboard on your screen, type in your comment or your observation or your question, um, and we'll uh, field those towards the end of the session. Um, we will put you in touch with Chris if you ask a question, or rather we'll show you show your email details um, so that if you ask a question, there's a need for any follow-up discussion that can uh, be made easier. Um, we are uh, recording the session today, so uh, if you want to go back and uh, remind yourself of the content, or if you have friends and colleagues who you think might be interested, um, the recording will be available in a couple of days up on a website, so you can uh, go back and look again. Um, <clears throat> so that's, I think, all by way of um, introductions and housekeeping. Um, just want to introduce Chris Williamson, Global Chair of Western Williamson and Partners, um, but an architect with um, extensive experience in urban planning um, and looking at uh, the role of cities and how the built environment uh, can contribute uh, to cities. Um, Chris, uh, we're delighted to have you with us um, and uh, really looking forward to your presentation. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I'll just share my screen. Just a Um, it's this one here. Yeah, so thank you very much. Thank you for that fantastic introduction. I'm honoured to be invited by the Lord Mayor, Michael Minnelli, to talk about the transformation of London's public transport system and how that is affecting the city and how our experience is influencing cities around the world. Uh, the QR code here will take you to my LinkedIn page, which has more thoughts and information. Um, so since a child, I've been fascinated by alternative visions of the future and still am. Uh, most of them, uh, when I was growing up, most of them are still to be realized and they are fascinating, if only because of their strangeness. Um, but in 1991, uh, we were chosen to design the Jubilee Line station at London Bridge, and since then have formed great relationships with engineers like Mott MacDonald, at, at, who we worked with on this project, but also Arabs, WSP, ACOM, and now Aegis. And uh, we've worked with them around the world on some of the most exciting transport, city shaping, sustainable projects. So th this is London Bridge. Um, and this diagram shows how the investment in transport helps energize the economy. Data proves that the revenue is increased by attracting development, growing jobs and opportunities. And not only that, but safe, efficient, well-designed transport helps combat climate change. We are all too familiar with these images which seem to crop up with increasing regularity um, and also what we've done to our cities and to environment by designing around the motor car uh, the way the car has dictated our lifestyle choices and the effects on our cities both the physical and mental health of, of all the city's habitants so I believe that London has led the world in showing how a city can change. And I'm proud to have played a small part in this. These are some of the projects uh, I've worked on and we've been able to export this expertise around the world and won the Queen's Award for Export. My colleagues in their unkind moments tell me I've built more 
below ground than Christopher Wren did above ground. And there's some truth in that, but I've loved every minute of it and it has helped shaped the city. London was formed from hamlets that became districts and still has a, a very distinct identity. Places like Chelsea, Hackney, Hampstead, you get people, you get buildings, you get an environment which is very distinct, very bespoke to that area. And now new transport infrastructure is given more choice uh, to where people live and work. The model on the left shows London with commuters coming into the city and the West End and then returning. Um, it's, that's a standard city model. But because of investment in public transport, the model on the right shows the quantum of development when Crossrail 2 and the Bakerloo line extension are complete, providing choices and new centres like Battersea, Elephant and Castle. And, and so London is becoming a true polycentric city. Cities are de de defined by their culture, their history and their heritage, but also by how people move around. In Sydney, for example, the double-decker trains trundling over the Harbour Bridge. Other cities like Los Angeles, San Francisco, Hong Kong. Uh, we don't want everywhere to be the same and it's important that solutions are different, but we all must learn for each other. So on a more modest scale, uh, one of my favourite projects to work on was the East London line. This was built for a modest budget, utilising existing Victorian engineering and infrastructure, but enabling new development all along the Kingsland Road and sites along the route in sight of the City of London. So it, it really has helped transform uh, this part of London, and which is within sight of the city but was one of the the, the a, a deprived area uh, but public transport safe efficient well designed public transport is helping to change that so after the east london line we worked on crossrail um, now the elizabeth line a much bigger and more complex project uh, the jubilee line made a lot of developers rich um, the government realised this and the funding model, model for Crossrail enabled 30% of the cost to come from private equity. And Crossrail 2, if built, would be 100%. So we first worked on Whitechapel Station, an edge of city location, submitted the scheme to Parliament. Uh, the reason these complex projects need an act of Parliament to proceed is that they can run through several local authorities, different planning committees, and all the major decisions need to be agreed together. You can't run the risk that one station in, say, Islington would not be approved and hold up the whole project. But after the Crossrail bill was in, approved, um, everything was retendered. We, we lost the, the Whitechapel project when it was retendered, which was traumatic but we won Paddington, which was wonderful. It's the only time in 40 years of practice that I've hugged my partner, Andrew Weston, uh, such as life. And to work on Isambard Kingdom Brunel's masterpiece was a privilege and a, a, a huge learning experience to try and imagine what he would do with our materials, our technology. And it was a wonderful project to, to work on working with a wonderful client and engineers um, and artists such as Spencer Finch and uh, the, the technology of these projects creating huge boxes underneath this is actually east, underneath Eastbourne Terrace and how you can get simplicity in a design in a really complex part of London so the, this this drawing shows the simplicity of coming out of Brunel's uh, station and then going across what used to be Departures Road where the taxis used to queue and, and going down into the box which is flooded from with light through this 120 meter long canopy uh, the length of a football pitch 
And so when you get off the trains, you can immediately see the, the light above. And it's a very simple, clear wayfinding uh, to get to where you need to go. So this is Spencer Finch, who's for, we worked with an artist from New York. So he did a cloudscape on the canopy. He came over from New York and analyzed all the different kinds of clouds that you would get between Paddington and Bristol. Um, <clears throat> so after, at the same time as working on the Paddington project, we were also doing uh, Woolwich, which is in the eastern, the most easterly underground station so originally there wasn't going to be a station in Woolwich but Barclay Homes and the local authority Greenwich uh, petitioned Parliament and created new homes a new community a new vibrant part of London on the strength of a new station which takes you into the heart of Canary Wharf and the city and the West End and increasing the quantum of development so it's creating new communities and also great urban realm most of the stations we, we took great care into integrating them into the urban environment so as, as well as new homes there are new bars restaurants cafes a new sense of place uh, around the public transport so when when we started um that, that when i started talking i was talking about the future and i've written quite extensively about the the future when you imagine how technology has changed the way that we work the the technology of future transport is going to transform our cities and there's a lot of dystopian imagery around the future of cities but i actually think it's going to be it's going to enable a green and pleasant place. Um, I was 12 when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon and thought technology was the answer to everything. And I probably still do. Um, but this is the Neuilly plan of Rome, 1748. And we still like these spaces, these squares, these streets, our eyesight and our perception and our feelings. We haven't changed as humans in 2000 years, but technology has changed a lot. We, this is the hand of Cabusier. He's a, he, I believe he was a great architect, but a terrible urban designer. People don't respond to these sorts of spaces as they do in, in the, the spaces that we used to create, traditional squares, traditional streets. So that I think integrating public transport into the city is, is a key of how we're going to go forward as, as, a, as a society. This is Milton Keynes, uh, the, the last sort of new town built in the UK. And it was all designed about around the motor car inspired by Los Angeles. We wouldn't design like that now. This is uh, a Western Williamson scheme of a new city with high speed transport right in the center and no cars at all, no privately owned vehicles within this whole 2.5 mile diameter city with radial and um, diagonal transport, which is integrated and, and joined up this is our our envisaged new town and we have the technology to build really interesting spaces um and create a new a, a new type of architecture and the the future might be scary but i think we we have to embrace it and we also have to think just because we have got the technology we should only use it if it's going to improve our cities actually make them better I think th th some of those images that I showed you right at the front, just because we can design in a certain way, doesn't mean to say we should. We should look at what technology we want to make our cities more sustainable and more attractive and more friendly, and then use the technology as appropriate. So what, one of the things we've been working on with Tyson Krupp, the German lift manufacturer, is uh, integrating lifts 
that can travel horizontally as well as vertically. And that can affect the, the shape of our cities to give space back to the urban realm at ground level and then have the reception areas on, a, on, a, on the fifth floor of a building, have different, different forms of buildings uh, using new technology and only using the technology if it's good for the planet. So no, no vision of the future can be complete without a reference to Hyperloop. It still seems to be, it always seems to be 20 years away, but we've been looking at how that might, we, we, we've been working a lot in Australia and looking with, with Arabs about how that might be integrated into cities. This is Melbourne and the, 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 one of the interesting things about Australia is the connecting the cities could be done in a really interesting way using Hyperloop and it is it is it will be interesting to see if these technologies develop the way that they are expected to but also I think one thing that COVID has taught us in the last few years is that speed isn't everything as long as we're connected we could actually all slow down and travel could be slower as long as you can live and work in a, a, a and be connected uh, wherever you are, you could actually choose to travel a lot slower. And I think sometimes, we, we in, in, when it comes to sustainability, we all need to think about traveling less, doing more locally, shopping locally with local products, and and have have less transport. So I don't want to talk myself out of the, the career that I've had, but it is. It is really interesting to look at what we need to do and how technology is helping us and the kind of connectivity we need. So, and I, so this is a this is a, a scheme of ours looking at New York. I worked in New York in 1980, and whenever I go back, it 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 doesn't really get any better in terms of crossing the street, the hustle and bustle is something that's, that's attractive about New York, but sometimes it just gets a bit too much. So we did a scheme which looked at pedestrianizing and traffic calming the whole of Broadway. So from north to south, you could there would be at least be one street that you could walk up, walk up around without the uh, without being threatened by the traffic. And I think these sorts of spaces in the heart of the city would be really attractive. And that, there's, a, there's a Scandinavian urban designer, Jan Gale, who has been a great influence on, on me throughout my life. And if, if, uh, it's, it's really fantastic that the city of London has incorporated this in a lot of the junctions. If there's one thing that I would like to do in the rest of my career is have the pavements cross the junctions and not the roads so that the cars have to stop um, for pedestrians at the junctions. And this is a this is a really powerful symbol, I think. So the the car the streets don't continue, the roads don't continue, but the pavements do. And you can already see this happening. This is actually in Miami. Um, and this is a fantastic model uh, where the streets are given to people. So the foreground cars can still travel, but they have to slow down for the people. And it creates a really interesting environment. And admittedly, these are high class shops, but there's no reason why this can't be universally adopted. So that's a, a basic run through uh, some of my thoughts on how the transport systems that London have started to incorporate um, have affected the city and, and a glimpse into the future. Um, so looking at what, what designing for how we're going to live in our cities, the kind of environment we want and using the technology as appropriate uh, to create sustainable, thriving cities. Thank you. 
Well, thank you very much indeed, Chris. Um, a really uh, interesting run through um, some of the the impacts of uh, investment in, in infrastructure, I guess. Um, I think the first question is, um, <clears throat> You know, what do you think your appetite is for large infrastructure development um, in the UK? Um, there's been obviously been, you know, in London a lot of stuff. There's been a lot of debate about HS2 and where that goes. Um, but just generally, how do you think we're placed in terms of our appetite for um, for useful infrastructure development? Um, I, th I think it's always difficult when the economy isn't in great shape. Uh, but it is a fantastic investment. All of the projects that we've worked on uh, have regenerated parts of London. And it's one of my sort of proudest achievements, really, is to see how the city grows on the back of public transport. So I think it is an investment. But obviously, when you haven't got the money in the first place, I'm, I'm surprised in some ways that there aren't more there isn't more private investment in infrastructure, but the it, the returns are more long-term uh, for most funders. And also uh, accrue over, over time. Um, so they go to the local authority in terms of business rates and rent and in terms of the economy generally so it's it's more difficult for private finance to capture but i i can't think of a of a of a transport project that hasn't been a long-term success i mean the victorians you only you have, you only have to look at history of all those private um railway companies and yes some of them did fail initially. There's always funding difficulties, but that they've all been long-term successes. And we're still utilizing the infrastructure that the Victorians bequeathed us. So I, 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 think, I think it was a pity that uh, HS2 isn't going to Manchester. I mean, it's, it's a sad indictment that, you know, if all we get out of HS2 is a quick and more capacity to the Birmingham, it kind of defeats the whole object. Uh, so I, 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 I'm a big advocate for improving the economy by efficient public transport. I think it's a rail travel is really a really interesting way, exciting way to travel. And as long as you've got the connectivity, it's, it, it, it's, um, you can work on the train you can you know it, it, you it, it's a great way to travel and it would be great for the, the the economy i think and it's a it's a pity that cities like manchester leeds newcastle edinburgh won't benefit from that connectivity and, and i know there's talk of connecting them in a, in each other but i think you need to have a broader plan for the for the country in order to make it work I just remember in December I travelled from uh, Beijing to Shanghai on the bullet train, um, six and a half hours at <laughs> very high speeds, um, and it, but certainly you know, China has a different structure in terms of being able to do uh, long-term infrastructure planning. Um, I'm going to move on to a question from Elizabeth Wrigley, who first of all says good morning, um, but asks how important it is to make infrastructures such as bridges, stations, etc., exciting destinations. Um, places that people want to go to? Um, I, I think it's vital. I mean, I, 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 I think, you know, that, that sense of excitement for travel is really important. Uh, people are often in an elevated state of anxiety when they're traveling. So it needs to be calm, uh, but it also needs to be inspirational. I mean, I, I still, love being in St Pancras or Paddington. I mean, they are just beautiful structures. It's like, to me, it's like being inside a St Paul's Cathedral. It's that you get that sense of wonder uh, for, from that. So I think it's important that they we, we, we design beautiful buildings for, for everything. 
And the great thing about the Victorians were they did it for everything. They did it for pumping stations. They did it for water treatment works. There, there was this, where, wherever there was a public project, there was no, there's also great architects, great engineers and great artists working together. And uh, we've kind of lost that. I, I, I think on some of our projects, uh, Crossrail in particular, uh, they commissioned artists to work alongside the architects. And it was a great experience. And it, it's made the projects really interesting. And the, the, the traveling public really appreciate that, I think. They, they like to think that there's some care being taken in, in their environment because it's something they're using every day. Um, and it, it's important. It's important for what people's well-being to be able to look around and, and, and enjoy uh, good architecture. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael Shapiro is online and he asks, um, look at your schoolboy dreams. Um, is there a project that you remember from you know, early in your life you'd still like to take part in? You'd still like to get off the off the off the ground. Um, I, I I think there's it's it's always been fascinating looking at things like tomorrow's world and uh, those visions of the future, and, and even now with automated vehicles we don't really there's going there will be a tipping point of when automated vehicles appear in our cities and how they're used but we've got no idea when that's going to be really it, 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 the, these things are never as straightforward as you think uh, you can design the product uh, but you've got to take society you've got to wait for society to sort of catch up and think well this is a good idea and you, you can see i mean from whether it's a tablet uh notebook that that steve jobs invented and i know it took it take it, all, it take, took a long time before the iphone mobile phones became in common use and now we can't envisage life without them uh but I mean, I, I think I, I follow Hyperloop a lot just because that is something from my childhood, uh, the idea that it, you can vacuum, suck, suck the air out of a tube. And it, it seems to be, on the face of it, a very sustainable way of traveling. And you can imagine, you can imagine a, a, up the viaduct of the M1 uh, above you, um, a, a hyperloop connecting all our major cities. So I, I but I, it, it, I think it might it might have what, our connectivity now because of COVID and the pandemic and because of us working in a different way. We might that might not be as necessary now as it as it was or, or we thought it was. So I, I I'd rather look at what is going to make our cities beautiful and the way we travel within them and between them, uh, what's going to make it attractive and make us value uh, the environment and, and be responsible to the environment rather than saying, well, that, that's a technology that I'd like to see used. I, I have no great desire to strap on a jet pack or to be carried around in a drone or or be in in what is envisaged in blade runner go flying through the city I'd, I'd much rather cycle to be honest i'd much rather walk in a pleasant city uh than think of a new form of technology that i'd, I'd like to use i do you remember um michael Manelli, our lord mayor um, did think what once that we might build a uh, Hyperloop or something all around the N25, which would, amongst other things, link the major London airports together. Um, but that's another another story. Um, Chris Wood uh, has asked whether you would like to. Co I mean, you gave us an example of a circular city, um, but would you like to comment on the Saudi plan for a linear for linear cities and the Neom project? Um, I have to be careful what I say because we have done some work on it. 
uh, we were fortunate to be asked to work on some of the transport uh, aspects of it, the railway aspect. I think I love the ambition. I love the the the. I, I was skeptical before I went out to see the site uh, that a linear city would be the right solution, but I can actually I can see why they're proposing that. The, the, the landscape is actually stunning, um, and to have this ribbon uh, development running the whole way through it will be absolutely amazing if it, if it works and if they get the technology right. The interesting thing from my point of view is having worked on projects since the Jubilee line uh, on, on fantastic city shaping projects in, in London, in Toronto, in Melbourne, in Sydney, in lots of different places. Uh, this, this is the next level of sort of transformation. So rather than it being a city shaping project, it's actually a country shaping project and it goes along with an agenda of what they're trying to do to change the country um so but i i i i think it it's it's it, so it's supposed to be for nine million inhabitants um so i think there are, there are some really interesting aspects to it and i i would love to see it built to see how it works uh, from from a personal point of view, um, <clears throat> the things I love about it is there are no cars at all. That you you travel on the railway um, from the airport at one end to the resort at, at the other end, and there's a marina in the middle. There's you know it, 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 there's a lot of thought gone into it, and a lot of um, a lot of intelligence, a lot a lot of exciting. Uh, developments go, going into it as well. So I, I, I think it's, I think it's the next. For, for me, it's, for, for me, it's a, it's a, it's a project that I've really enjoyed working on, and um, I can see it being incredible. Um, and I, I think it's going to be really exciting. But it's, it is actually, you know, sometimes you can be overly ambitious. And that would be my only reservation about it. Is, uh, but it, it's it's nice in some ways that somebody does have that amazing vision of the future. Um, Alistair Lenz is sort of good, good picking up on the Hyperloop question. I mean, he's asked if you had to choose between Hyperloop or HS2 as a way to travel between London and Manchester, um, which would you choose? So personally, I, I think to me, it's all about the experience. I mean, I, I, I don't, I can't envisage at the moment that Hyperloop is going to be an exciting experience. I mean, being in a tunnel for, for you know, admittedly you can have screens, you can have information and it'll be quick. Uh, but I, I, I like the romance of train travel and, uh, I, I think when it comes to train travel uh, and Hyperloop for that matter, you, you we can actually do a lot more in joined up travel. So when you get up, when you get to the station at the other end, uh, which I, I think our train operators often think of station to station travel, but they don't think of destination to destination and how how you how we can link up uh, better. Uh, travel options so that you know that there's that there's either a, a tram or a train or something a, a, even a bike uh, to meet you at the other end so that you that they're all bookable as well so i think to to me it's about the the the, the whole travel experience uh and and you know making sure you've got to see it making sure that things work whether it's hyperloop or high-speed train, uh, mm. and and also as long as if you if you can be connected and you can work comfortably, I think that's 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 really important. Um, so whichever one, so as I said before, we we should be designing using the technology 
uh, to make to improve our lives and, and not just using the technology because we've we've now got it. Um, another question has come in just asking you know, what role AI might have in the design of urban transportation. Are we already seeing um, sort of AI applications starting to work alongside designers? Um, I, I think AI is a increasingly important uh, aspect. We, we the, at the company of architects, we've we have an annual lecture. Um, and on June the 19th, uh, Professor Stuart Russell, who gave the wreath lectures uh, a couple of years ago, um, I heard him speak and wrote to him straight away. And, and two years ago, AI was sort of in the dim and distant future. But since then, it's it's now with us and part of our life. We've got we've got amazing young architects in our office that do the most amazing work using AI tools. Um, and it, it is, in a way, it's frightening because it's a, it's a very de democratic tool. So if you wanted your kitchen redesigned or, or, or house designed or a hospital or whatever, if you give it enough prompts, um, it will design for you. Um, so it's something that en anybody will be able to use. So our architects have to embrace it to make it better. Uh, but it is, and, and in this, but it is going to be a very powerful tool. Um, and the amazing thing is that it's it's improving 24 hours a day while we're sleeping. Uh, AI is getting better and better all the time. So it will. It is already a, a powerful tool in the way that cities are designed um, and being able to program in different options and look at um, the relationship between schools, hospitals, the number of houses, offices and the working out a development model um, is, is it's incredibly powerful. So it is it is going to have a really important role as we develop. Um, Hugh Purse has come back to the question of um, car cars. Is that, and you know, do you see significant changes to car use in the relatively near future? Um, people have talked about car trains on motorways. Obviously, we've talked about driverless vehicles, but either from the UK or from elsewhere. Do you see, you know, what's your prediction as to the way things are likely to go? I think most people envisage that there'll be more automated vehicles on the ro roads. So, like at the moment, you you, you call for an Uber, um, you'll call for a driverless car, and they will be owned by the the company. Uh, so they you you won't need to own a, a vehicle. Um, but I think most people envisage that future, but when that becomes a reality is still some time away, I think. Um, but it, and, and nobody at the moment seems to be able to predict when that's going to be. I mean, there's all sorts of tests in San Francisco and elsewhere where this is all already a reality, but it's not in common usage yet. So integrating um, automated vehicles onto our streets. But I, I think in some of the new towns and new developments, it'll be a lot easier to integrate than it will to retrofit into our cities like Nottingham or Manchester. It, 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 it's harder to retrofit uh, technology than sometimes as we were talking about in Saudi Arabia, to actually integrate it right from the start. But I think my only plea is, is let, let's use these technologies uh, if they make our cities better, uh, more pleasant places and more sustainable and not use the technology because we, we can do. I think as a race, we, we, we have great vision and whenever we realize that we've created a problem for ourselves and that that happened in the Victorian era with 
um, horse and carts in the city. When you see old footage of horse and cart transport in the 1840s, 1850s, and you know, before when goods were being transferred off off uh, trains in Bishopsgate and go, going around the city. The, the city was a horrendous place. We have we tend to forget how well we've improved our cities from what they used to be. Um, and we should take a lot of comfort from that because when, when we realize that things are bad for us, like smoking or a solid fuel, we do do something about it and we are very resourceful. So I, I suppose I'm an optimist and I, I think we are, but I think most people do forget how much we are improving our environment and things are generally getting better rather than getting worse. Thank you. Um, I just wonder, you know, can, can, can you give us some examples of um, you know, cities that have learned directly from London uh, or indeed things that London has learned from else, elsewhere? So I think one of the great one of the great things that London has done is made it slightly harder to drive uh, and changing things, just small things like changing traffic lights. So you get more pedestrian priority uh, and some of the things that London, the Transport for London have done in places like Archway, um, Highbury Corner, that taking out uh, gyratory systems, huge traffic roundabouts, and creating better public realm. So not, not many cities around the world have been able to have the political dynamism to actually do that, uh, to invest in public transport and bring in congestion charging to help pay for it so and then because the political environment isn't the same so I think tweaking making it less attractive to drive and improving public transport have to go hand in hand and a lot of cities haven't been able to do both of those they've been able to do maybe one of them uh, but not both so I think I think London is a much nicer place to walk around, particularly the city. Um, the, the, it is a, is a much nicer place to be in uh, than it has been for a long time. Um, but the, we, we, we've, we have learned a lot from other, from working in different countries. I mean, one of the things I like about working in Sydney is transport for New South Wales. As soon as you walk into their office, they have this, slogan which is custom the customer is at the heart of everything we do and they spend a lot of time talking to their customers so when we're designing anything we we test it out with different customer focus groups and there's a lot more research into the kind of stations they want the colors the lifts the escalators the layout and there's there's a and that sort of democracy is really good, I think, and it, it brings the whole of the community with you. So I, I like to be involved with the people that the, the projects are for and to get their input. So we, we have learned a lot from working in different places, but I think London is still, you know, a great place to work because we, we've got, we, we do, have great stakeholder engagement in um, in 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 London and have a developed system of uh, improving public transport at the expense of making it slightly more difficult for car ownership. Well, thank you very much. We're we're out of time, I'm afraid, so we can't take any more. Um, I'll leave the last word to my colleague Charlotte, um, who comment who's commented. There's certainly no rom romance at the moment. Uh, when traveling on UK trains, <laughs> um, certainly maybe not as much as there was uh, in, in in the days when uh, train travel was uh, more prevalent. Um, we've got some uh, interesting content coming up um, on Friday. 
a national monotechnic in the city, the history of the Leather Feathers Technical College. Uh, Tuesday next week, Green Spaces, Cultivating the Mind, and then a session on Thursday the 28th of March on It's Not <coughs> What You Know, It's Who You Know, uh, What Does It Take to Be a Female Engineer? Um, so we have um, an interesting uh, set of lectures coming up. Uh, it just remains for me to uh, thank you, the audience, for attending today and for your questions, uh, and to offer a huge round of thanks uh, to Chris Williamson. Um, Chris, it's been great to have you with us, and thank you so much for your contribution today. It's been really inspiring.